I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 28th of October, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. It is another gorgeous day in the rain or the same day. It's been a big tropical storm and I'm just enjoying the fact that it is cool and the weather is beautiful and I am a pluviophile. I love the rain, so I'm enjoying getting to record in it. I've got the camera a little bit under the eaves so that it's not getting wet because it does cause some problems even though the camera can handle it. And uh, I'm just, I'm just enjoying this. We actually had some really bright sunlight just a little bit ago, but today we're gonna be answering some questions from Andrew, who actually gave us a slew of questions. It's gonna take days to get to all this stuff, so Andrew, I apologize, we can't get to it all in one day, but today we're gonna to start with some questions about ISPs and internet connectivity for people who are working from home and what you may want to do with that, not just with, different than things we've answered in the past, and we're also gonna talk about the availability of some fruit. All for Andrew. We've got a number of Q&As coming up today, uh, I think tomorrow, and in, the, in we've got quite a bit uh, for the future, but if you have not asked your own questions yet, scroll down, ask a question. You can do that while we're listening to the book. One of the nice things about the rain is that we actually have a little bit cooler weather and it keeps the camera from overheating so quickly, which you guys know is always a challenge. So that is actually a nice thing, but it also makes it really hard for me to use my phone because everything is wet all the time. So Andrew asked, I'm wondering about a low cost internet backup. Let's suppose I pay for good fast speed internet where I end up living in Leon. Let's say that this primary internet, oh, and the rain just took my, took my stuff away. I have to read a little bit closer. Let's say that this primary internet is not working for a moment or a short period of time. Is there any reason to have a backup internet solution? I have a TEP MiFi device, which is supposedly able to work worldwide and it's prepaid. I could also get Google Project Fee on my phone. Or maybe there's another option. Or maybe you know that when the internet goes out, there's, pract there's no practical solution for backup. You just lose internet for a little while. I say this because sometimes I teach classes online where I live in New York. I have a backup and sometimes when one connection is not working well, I switch. If you can let me know what is the chance, uh, when you get the chance, that would be awesome. Okay, so the first thing, so I work from home, I deal with people all day long who work in this way and, and completely depend on their internet access. So I'm very used to this and specifically here in Leon, he's asking about this city in particular, but this is generally applicable to almost all of Nicaragua. So the first thing is our internet is not like in the United States and Canada. It actually works here. So you're, you're, feeling that you need to have a backup solution at all times probably is uh, a bit more emotionally driven than it is uh, driven by an actual need. That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing and you shouldn't do it, but your level of thinking that you're going to need it is probably not applicable to Nicaragua. I grew up in the United States. I work with many hundreds of customers there and they have internet problems all the time. Here in Nicaragua, internet problems are rare. Now, we'll Power is different. We have little power outages all the time. We talk about that a lot. That's different. But the good internet providers here don't go down with the power. The internet stays on, at least until you have really massive power outages, at which point it's not going to matter. Say it was down for an entire day. It truly never happens. But if it were to happen, the internet would probably eventually go down and they would all go down. So having a backup wouldn't matter. Let's start with a couple things. First of all, there's only so many providers here in the country. Same thing in the United States. A lot of companies will sell you access, Google for example, but they don't own their own towers. So their backup isn't necessarily a backup. They're just reselling you something you already had access to. So in the US, you generally have three tower providers for wireless. So that is the AT&T's, the T-Mobile's, and the Verizon's. Everyone else is reselling one of theirs by and large. Exceptions exist, but almost always they're reselling one of those. Normally, wherever you live, you then have two normal providers of internet by land. One is the cable provider, one is the phone provider. The phone provider generally uses fiber, but not always. In most locations in the United States, that is all you can get, and in many locations don't have all five of those, but most have at least four of them. Of those, generally your wireless carriers are not very good. You would not want to use them for any type of work, and your landline providers are buggy and have poor customer service, so you're likely to have lots of outages. Everyone, the experience of outages in the United States is unlike anywhere I've ever seen. It is so bad. 
Uh, that said, so those are the five you have to work with. Here in Nicaragua, it's not that different, except we have the reverse. We have two wireless providers, Tigo and Claro, that are available almost everywhere. And then we have generally three landline providers, Tigo, Claro, that mirrors the other two, and Teco. There are other providers. I don't know much about how they work as far as reselling the infrastructure of one of those or not, but we basically have five providers the same. Key difference is, at least with Teco, your number of outages approaches zero. They are a nationwide fiber provider, but they're a little bit harder to get. You have to have either a Cedula or a business here in order to qualify for Teco, or you need to rent from someone who has a Teco agreement, which will be very hard to find. Not impossible, but very hard. Normal people don't do business with Teco. They're primarily a business provider, but they do fiber. It is fast. It is extremely reliable to a degree that any normal person working from home would not want to consider a backup solution because the Teco is that good. And I mean that. Even if you're a full-time content creator and online worker running teams internationally like I am, I don't need a backup solution. Now, that said, I have a backup solution, that's Claro, and I only keep it for when I need to do big uploads or I just wanna you know, move some data off to another network, run something through the night and not have it affect my main network, uh, just in extreme cases, because we have lots of people working from the house, but I can tell you in all the time that we've lived here, we have lots of problems with our Claro, mostly because we don't worry about it because we never switch to it and our Teco has never gone down, so we've never needed to switch to the Claro, uh, except for one time that we had some, it was an extended power outage, and I don't think Teco actually went down, we just wanted to try the Claro because of something, and then found that it didn't work, and then we never get around to, to working on it because the Teco is always working. For almost everyone, including large offices, you just don't bother with a secondary connection. It's, it's generally not worth it. Um, and especially if you're just doing normal work, like teaching online, people have outages, right? If you were in the United States, the, ch the chances that both of your internet providers would go down at the same time is greater than the chances that Teco will go down alone here. So you're already dealing with a better scenario than your American counterparts. Paying extra while pretty cheap to have an additional provider probably doesn't make any sense unless you have a really specific need. We would only, we only ended up doing it because we got the Claro first and it took us a while to get the Teco put in. If we had gotten the Teco first, we would never have gotten the Claro. And at some point we may cancel it because it doesn't really make any sense for us. Again, the Teco is just that good. We use Teco here at the house, all of our other locations, any place that we invest, any place that we're involved in, any place where we're choosing the internet, we put in Teco. So we know how they work everywhere. and We're very, very happy with them. Um, as far as using uh, something like the MiFi or Google Fee or any of those things uh, for additional wireless connectivity, I can't say that they're going to work. They might, but assume that they're not. Um, if you want to have a wireless backup, just have a normal phone plan. You don't need specialty stuff here. Uh, just using, I have an iPhone, you can use an Android, I have Tigo, but you could get Claro, it doesn't matter. Pay for their data and it's really, really fast. Um, it'll probably work for anything that you need. I know lots of people who, if they, for whatever reason, don't have internet at home, that's all they use. Lots of people only use that and it works just fine. So it's, it's again, not like the US, it's much faster and much more reliable. So generally that will work fine, um, but you'll probably never need to go to it. What we find is much more probable is people will have a problem with their laptop and they'll switch to their phone and their phone will, will put them on that or they'll wanna work from a cafe or something and they'll be on Tigo or Claro and work that way. So in general, you're just not going to need a failover. If you decide you do need a failover, if that really is something you're just, I'm gonna say, you don't, right? Zero chance that you need it. But if you decide to go down that path against my financial and business judgment and advice, then having um, a secondary connection from a Claro or a Tigo as a landline would be very cheap, maybe 30 to $40 per month. Um, and if you want to have uh, a phone service, like, like a cell service to do that, you're looking at probably more like $12 per month. And of course, you can just do uh, pay as you go and only use it if there's an outage, but that can be a pain. You kind of want it at the ready, but it's really, really cheap. So you've got a lot of options in a situation where you don't really need any options. Uh, now, if you're gonna have Claro or Tigo as your landline, I don't use them myself. They may have more outages. I do know that out at the beach, we would have problems where an extended power outage that out at the beach, they didn't have the, the big generators like they do in the city, so they didn't last as long. But if you're in the city, I've never known them to have an outage. It doesn't mean they don't, but I've never known it. So probably even with those, as long as you have a good stable connection in your house, 
you're probably good to go with those as well. But if you can get Teco, I can't recommend it enough. It is worth the extra money. It gives you, it's just faster, cleaner service with zero problems. Back with teacher Andrew again. Okay, I know I already asked a ton of questions about how taxes work, and now I have some questions about fruit. The tax questions were asked now, but they're not gonna be answered for a few days, so they're out of order. Uh, are there weekly farmer markets in Leon? Quick, quick answer, no. Uh, do you know if there are lots of organic fresh fruit options or is the fruit in Nicaragua mostly conventional? Is there fruit also available at the supermarket? How does composting work? Um, and of course, my phone freaked out because it's wet. Uh, do food scraps typically get thrown in the trash? Are all these tropical fruits readily available in supermarket or farmer's market? All right, then he has a list. We're going to get to that after we answer the questions. Okay, so is there a weekly farmer's market? No, because everything's a farmer's market. Like, there's no need for a farmer's market. That's a very American thing. That would be so weird here to be like, we're setting up a weekend supermarket that's the same as what's on the street every day. If you want to go to a farmer's market, just walk down the street. There's people selling fruit and vegetables everywhere. Um, and right from the front, you can go to the farms and get them. The farms are just outside of town. They go straight into the stands. Like, it, just think of it as, an, as a 24-7 farmer's market, and it's truly 24-7. Even out here in the suburbs, they never close because it's cheaper to have someone watch it than to close it up at night. So that's just what they do. They keep them open often through the night. Um, do you know if there's lots of organic fruits? So people don't call things organic here. That's, again, these are very American things. Um, there is a lot of organic fruit here, but you won't necessarily know where it is. A lot of the farms do use pesticides and things. A lot are organic. No one's going to label it. Um, probably nothing's like the U.S. It's not like the U.S. where you have to worry about it. Clean your fruit, be normal, but things are very healthy here in general. I realize that's not a great answer. I wish everything was organic myself, but uh, we're getting very, uh, very healthy food in general. So it's, it's not like the U.S. where you have all these weird chemicals and there's just tons and tons of, of artificial stuff going on. There is some, but in general, it's very little. Um, I, I just... I, my recommendation is not to worry about it um, and, and buy from the markets. Uh, is there fruit also available at the supermarket? Absolutely, the grocery stores are normal like anywhere else. Uh, how does composting work? Does food scraps typically get thrown in the trash? Just like anywhere else, like the US, yes, typically gets thrown in the trash, but should you compost? Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Do people compost? Absolutely. If you wanna know about composting, permaculture, that kind of stuff, um, I'm not the expert, right? But I'm absolutely supportive. Go do that. Fantastic. Um, I, my approach to all that stuff is have wild areas of grass and throw your food in it. Um, <laughs> like, just let nature do its thing. Um, but uh, Jack Pittman, that interviewed me just a few days ago, his channel, Jack Pitt Pittman Nika, uh, he is composting in the city, right? Like in Managua. So he's paying attention to that stuff and has good ideas about things that specifically would apply here. So check out his channel, ask him questions. He's definitely your resource for that. And then are all these tropical fruits ready available in the supermarket? Let's see what we got here. And the answer I know to most of them is gonna be yes. Bananas, absolutely this is a banana produ production country. Mangoes, these actually are generally not available in the supermarket because if you just walk down the street, eventually one will fall on your head. There are so many mangoes here that you, no one buys them, right? They are everywhere, so no shortage of mangoes. Pineapples, yes, you can buy pineapples here, no problem, because we are a major pineapple producing country. Uh, we are in the North Pacific, same as Hawaii. Uh, we get both varieties. We get what we call Nicaraguan pineapples and what we call Hawaiian pineapples. That is definitely not their names. That's what people refer to them as. Ours are white, theirs are yellow. Honestly, the Hawaiian ones are better. The Nicaraguan ones are cheaper. We get all those. Papaya. We have so many papaya. We have dedicated papaya stores. Um, and it grows wild, uh, like wild, wild. There's a wild papaya tree right behind me right now as I speak. And multiple enormous mango trees. Uh, not quite in view, but right here. Young coconut. Okay, I don't know what makes a coconut young. Um, you'll have to excuse me for not being up to date on the ages of my coconuts, but you'll see coconut trees behind me and coconuts just fall into the yard. Uh, people just shimmy up the trees and get them. They sell them on the street sides all over the place. No problem getting coconut. Durian. Okay, so this one is an Asian fruit. For those who are not familiar, durian is this really pungent fruit that is really popular in Southeast Asia. And that is, uh, um, 
a major food source that we don't have here. I've never seen durian for sale. I'm not aware of it being for sale. It will grow here, to the best of my knowledge. I have done research on that. That was not just me guessing. Um, so from my research, you could grow it here, but I don't know that they allow you to bring it in because foreign, like lemons are illegal to bring in, uh, to grow, uh, because, because it's non-native. So I've never seen it available and I've never seen it grown. And to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't grow in any kind of native way. So I'm gonna say probably can't get durian. Jackfruit, I don't know what the, the situation is with growing it. We've never looked into it too much, but you can get it here. So I don't know if it's being brought in. I don't know if it's being grown here. I don't know if you can grow it at your house, probably. Um, but we do eat it from time to time, but not a ton. We don't see it as like papaya, which we see absolutely everywhere. So I'm not really sure. All right, and then vegetables. Oh, also what's the veggie scene like there? I heard there's not much for leafy greens. I don't know that that's really true. It's that people don't eat a ton of leafy, leafy, leafy greens. It's not exactly the same. I'm sure there's not a ton available, but I mean, there's quite a bit. Uh, do they have these veggies for sale? Celery, absolutely, we buy it all the time. Broccoli, we eat it all the time, certainly. Spinach, yep, every grocery store has that. Peas, um, I don't know how, what the availability is. We definitely eat them, so we're getting them, but I don't know if we're like getting them in a can or I don't, I don't do the cooking. We definitely get peas, um, but it might be that we're paying a premium for them or getting them frozen or something, so just be prepared. Uh, carrots, yes, carrots are everywhere here. That Carrots and like broccoli, these are part of like the everyday cuisine here. Um, so tons. Onions, absolutely everyone eats onions here. You actually have, uh, so my wife is allergic to onions. Um, so the, the availability of onions, the common use of onions is so high that it causes dietary problems for her that it is extremely difficult to get away from, uh, away from onions. Potatoes, yes, potatoes are one of the absolute staples. People eat them almost every day. And we, you know, it's super common. Yucca, yes, every street vendor is selling yucca. They are, it, it is everywhere, everywhere. Squash, yes, another local food. Um, it's not the same as like yucca that people are having it for nearly every meal, but squash is widely available. People eat it, it's a, it's a common food. Cabbage, yes, we don't eat it as much here. Uh, it's much more of a, an El Salvador thing. They eat it with like every meal, but that's not far away. That's like 80 miles away. It's like part of every meal. Um, so here it's less common, but easily available. Uh, pepper, yes, assuming you mean green pepper. This is a funny one. The word for that here is chitoma. Uh, and that is actually the Nahuatl word for tomato. So that's super confusing. And if you go to Costa Rica and try to say the same thing, they will think you mean tomato. Uh, and they'll think you're trying to speak in Nahuatl. They're confused all the way around. Uh, but here it is used. Literally everyone calls peppers chitomas and they like onions are added to everything. So the amount that it's available is out of control. Uh, and then lastly, tomatoes. Yes, um, I don't know how much we actually grow the tomatoes here, but tomatoes are used in everything. They are one of the uh, super stock vegetables that you will find just everywhere all the time in many different varieties. And like, so if you're going to a typical restaurant, um, it is really common, for example, to have a salad of lettuce and cucumber and carrot and tomato. Those are ingredients that are included just with everything all the time and onions and chitoma in everything that's being cooked, uh, peppers. Um, and squash is a very common flavor. So a lot, almost all those things that you're, list, that you're listing are the staples here um, and, and no problem finding them. And it's not just that you can get them. Peas, I think is the only one on that list. Celery a little bit. Celery is not a common like, uh, Nicaraguans don't just throw celery into everything the way that they do with say onions. Um, but if it comes to what's easily available for a, uh, if you're going to a restaurant, celery is gonna be, peas not a big deal. And if you're going to a grocery store, you have a lot more variety than the things that we've mentioned. Um, so it's, it's not gonna be that bad. There are a lot of things that shift. There's things that we can get apples, for example, but our variety of apples is nothing like you're getting in New York. Trust me, I'm from New York. I'm used to apples being everywhere and dirt cheap. Here, our apples are coming from New York and they only ship in certain ones and the price is quite high. So that's a specialty thing, getting pears here quite a bit harder. Lemons are all but impossible to get, but we have limes in unbelievable abundance, super cheap. We can't get oranges, but the grapefruit family in super abundance. So there's little bits of adjustment that you need to do. Some things we're able to get in juice form. Um, uh, in general, the vegetables I find have an extremely small amount of variation from the Northeast United States, whereas fruits actually have the bigger variation. We have lots of great fruit here, but 
what is available is different. Like I'm not used to having limes easily available. I'm used to having lemons easily available. The switch to limes is not a big deal, but it's a little thing you have to get used to. Um, there's, you know, the lack of apples, but the huge availability of guava, those kinds of things will throw you off a little bit. Once you get used to it, you'll be like, okay, there's just different fruits in the ecosystems and I get to eat a lot of watermelon, but a lot less cantaloupe. Little things like that are your adjustments. So. Andrew, thanks for your questions. We'll get to more of them in the near future. For everyone else, if you have, or Andrew as well, if you have questions that you want me to answer, just scroll down. I love being able to have these. It makes my life a lot easier to be able to get these out and I get to enjoy standing out in the rain and doing a show here on a lovely day. Uh, if you don't have any questions, feel free just to say hi or let me know what you think of the episode. Uh, leave your own comments about fruits and vegetables and things that you've found here or your internet experiences. If you have not tried Teco, definitely find a way to do so. It will make your life so much easier. They are a bit more expensive, but absolutely worth it, trust me. And I don't get any kickback from them, but I should. Come on, Teco. They have a cool logo, too. They have this owl. It's kind of like Duolingo. And uh, as always, please like, subscribe, share on social media, tell your friends about the show, let people know, post it on like the, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, all those kinds of things. That's how people find us. Otherwise, they have to search for it. And if people don't know to search for Nicaragua, they're not going to find out that we have really cool content about a really interesting place. And uh, of course, you know, if you're thinking about coming down, book a flight, come down, check it out. It's really nice. And I'll see all of you tomorrow.